and to and install happy green gas jets in the church birthday. so that we could have light in church. A I can see the camels in the old English yeah, church, and so I can imagine it being quite similar. Going on. In 1918, Reverend Marshall was interviewed for the well. job and was hired so it's five dollars per Sunday. Now that was uh, so good expecting morning, him to do the leadership Today in the morning, evening services, and probably assist with Sunday school. The application to, to become affiliated with the United Church of Canada. We gather looking at the early spring of 1926, who took a group of women to the presbytery meeting in Aylmer, Ontario, to take over the thoughts and get their input to make a formal application to the United Church. Uh, Reverend Menzies uh, was extended his invitation to St. Andrews and became the first minister of St. Andrews United Church. He had, service. in the past, Today been assistant minister at First United Church. Or an envelope service I, was conducted by Reverend that. Dr. We had a Dr. Martin, about that, who was a minister on, uh, of First Thursday. United Church at the time. And, then I found more and the name of St. Andrews was suggested at this like, particular this meeting easy. strongly so to become the name of this new church. The birth of the church. March 16th, Reverend Menzies resided over the first congregational meeting so the of St. Andrews United Church. And the first elected officials of the board we were Leslie Muddle as secretary. The following were elected to the board of stewards. Leslie Muddle, Albert Berry, Mrs. H. Dunlop, who was my grandmother, have have a big party Mrs. Today. Emma Hughes, and Mrs. H. Hamilton. And the uh, following members were elected to the session. Harry Hall, Harry Dunlop. And Mr. Hubbard. All sorts of wonderful things. Ladies visitors at the time so, uh, were Miss A. Claus, Mrs. E. Owen, and Mrs. L. Howarth. And calm ourselves. Mrs. Dorothy Berry became the first organist, so Mrs. Hamilton as assistant, and Mrs. Mrs. Nellie Dunlop as choir started. leader. I think there might be Mrs. one. Mrs. Devil, choir one. manager, and Albert but Berry became the one. church's treasurer. Do back here next week on Father's Day. Other groups that yes, were formed were the Junior League under the direction of Miss A. Claus and Young and People's Union and Ladies Aid. So Reverend Menzies left week, and, and Reverend E.J. Wilson them into fresh start. St. Andrews. It states that there were pews purchased from a closed Methodist church in Air for $100 and shipped down to St. Thomas by freight car. They were taken off by members of the congregation and installed at a total cost of $326.05. Fire director's salary at that time was $15 per year. To Say direct the choir that. at no sound. No minutes were available from okay. December the 30th, and 1929 Thursday, to January 1937. After Reverend E.J. Wolland left in June oh. 1930. It's the, yes, it should be the, the following Thursday. ministers yes. from 1930 to 1936 were Reverend M.M. Bennett. The month is flying by. Keith okay. Love. So this Thursday, Euchre. Reverend Dr. Clendenin, with a bunch of cool Reverend W. D. Yeah. Stenlake, Reverend L. W. Reed. In 32, a dramatic society was formed and was able to contribute to the treasury of the church, as well as adding a great deal of enjoyment for the people with their talent. In 1935, there were two dramatic societies, junior and senior. And there was also a CGIT a group older. mentioned. In 1936, on the right side of the grass. That's Reverend L. W. Reed right. passed away no while on vacation. In 1936, St. Andrew's Women's Association became affiliated with the newly formed Elgin As Presbytery we today, Women's we Association, the history, with Mrs. Clayton Searle of Dutton being the first the land president. Of indigenous people of this region. And in 1938 to 39 term, Mrs. Laura Howard right was the president of St. Andrews. As we live, Women's work, and worship upon traditional territory, we're mindful of the covenants. Jack Turner, Jack, right. John Earl Turner, but they called him Jack. His brother was George Turner and Art Turner. George married to Ida. Art's married to Lila. Oh, they're coming up the steps, and the choir going and sitting in there their pews, and singing in the choir. Grandma Turner sang in the choir for a couple of years. 
And then when she got too old, they gave her a little party. Grandma Turner, her name was? Mrs. Mark Turner Alice. Turner was my son, and he belonged to Sunday school. And when we went to church, he went downstairs when the minister called all the kids up. They all went downstairs to Sunday school. Uh, my sister-in-law, Ida Turner, and I started the We Too group for men and women. For St. Andrew's Church, very nice people, yeah, very friendly people, to see the paths and I enjoyed them. being with them all. I'm Shirley Moyes. I live at 53 we Chester those who Street. Have gone before us. I grew up on 43 Hall Street, there, this Devonshire now. We celebrate who we are and today. Ira Huff and my brother Bill. Possibilities my husband, Eugene Moyes, and his mother and dad, Peggy Harry Moyes, the God of yesterday, West today, Ave. and tomorrow. Uh, and let's start a, by singing group. the church. My mother's group was Friendship. Number 331, Grace United. Mary Ewens, Marjorie, your mother, Joan Stewart, and Jeannie Nod, Elsie Fryer, and Midge Irwin, Pat and Rosemary Almond. We used to make meat pies, and we had a real good time. My resort overlooked everything, and Marion Millman, she was one of the chief. She made the dough, <laughs> and it was fun. Hi, my name is Janice Stewart Crescolo. I am the daughter of Hudson and Joanne Stewart, sister to John, Richie, and Ellen Stewart. We lived at 16 Devonshire Place in St. Thomas, went to St. Andrews United Church. When I think of St. Andrews, I think of family. I think of our family going to St. Andrews to be with others. We worship together, we pray together, we help one another. We did this through various events that the church had to offer. One of the most difficult things about uh, going to St. Andrews Church was getting through a service without getting in trouble. It, oftentimes we get a little bored waiting for the minister to call us up to go to Sunday school. And uh, in those little boring periods of time, we would start laughing or talking too much. So that was a big challenge to share with you an article written by my mother, Joanne Stewart. Uh, this article was written in conjunction with the 85th anniversary of St. Andrews. Uh, Reverend David Moore had asked members of the congregation to share their experiences at St. Andrews Church um, growing up. And this is an article that my mom had written at the time she was well into calligraphy and has handwritten it in her calligraphy. I am going to read to you right now. I have been asked to tell about my early years at St. Andrews. When I was around five years old, my father, Bert McCormick, started to work for the Pear Marquette Railroad. It later became the Chesapeake in Ohio and we moved to 93 Chester Street. For about four or five years, my brother Andy and I attended Sunday school in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Alec MacArthur, 83 Chester Street. When they disbanded their Sunday school, my mother, Jessie McCormick, told me that we would be going to St. Andrew's Church. When she told me that, my stomach did a flip-flop at the thought of having to go to a new church. We were used to going to Sunday school at 11 a.m. Sunday morning, over to St. Andrews, Andy and I went. How fortunate we were that the person who greeted us was a smiling young lady named Nell Dunlop, who later married with his tough. She explained that Sunday school was at 3 p.m. each Sunday, but she invited us to stay for church and sit with her, as this was the first Sunday for the new minister who was young and unmarried much like the situation we have now. The minister was Reverend Keith Love. I remember that he told the story about the little engine who could. It was the first time that I had heard it. Every time I've heard the story or seen that smiling face of that little engine in a storybook, I think of Keith Love. But I especially think of that lovely lady now Dunlop Tuck, who met me at the door, and the 
great info she had all my life through the years. I remember Lucille Schoonover, Neil, as one of my Sunday school teachers, and how she had us memorize the Lord's Prayer and say it by ourselves without anyone saying it with us. Have you ever tried it? It's harder than you think, because we are used to saying the Lord's Prayer with others. Another Sunday school teacher was motherly Mrs. B. Dawson. I remember one Sunday the class getting into a, into a discussion about what we thought hell was like. I remember the boys had a terrific boys class called the Greyhounds. Mr. Billy Gowdy was one of the leaders, and I can't remember any of the other leaders except one of our ministers, Mr. Reed, being very involved with the class. They spent a lot of time at Remember these words Dexter. and have hope. The steadfast the years, love of the we had Lord a great mercy young people's group, His as mercy well has never as many come to other an groups. But the they one that is dearest to my heart great is was God's the first CTIT group at St. Andrews. Our leader was Ruth well, Dawson, we have an who later married today, George so Anderson. We have to have special How proud we were as we sat party. as a group at their wedding. Yeah. We did one money-making project a year. One year, we had a quintuplet tea. The girls dressed as quintuplets, Mama and Papa Dion, nurses, and I was Dr. Defoe. It was such fun. Out of that chartered group, there are just four of us left at St. Andrews. Victoria Garraway Bolt, Shirley Lucas Stone, Margaret Garraway Spruce, and myself, Joanne McCormick. Ruth got us together and formed a group of the Women's Association called the Rainbow Group. And it stayed together until 25 years ago when the United Church Women came into existence. Some of our memories are not always happy, but they are our memories and we are better people for having them. One of these memories took place in those CGIT years. One of our members was Helen Potts, who was a beautiful, gentle girl who was sickly and not in the best of health, but she was a joy to be around. One day, Helen took seriously ill and a few days later she died. We, as a CGIT group, dressed in our middies and black ties, which was our uniform, formed a guard of honor at the graveside and bade Helen goodbye by singing taps. This is a sad memory, but a memory I cherish because I had the privilege of knowing Helen. I look back on my years at St. Andrews. That story I heard so many years ago reminds me so much of St. Andrews, the little church that some people think can't do things, but with prayer and faith, and we are like the little engine. We think we can. We know we can. We knew we could. The key things that come to mind when I was at St. Andrews is Sunday School course, Mission Band, Explorers, CGIT, and Choir. And when I think of these, who do I think of but Marjorie Gowdy, Marjorie Gowdy, and Marjorie Gowdy. And along with Marjorie Gowdy, I think of Marilyn Draper, Sue Millman, Janet Coyle, Wendy Ball. And with this group of people, through CGIT, I can remember we would package up little candy bags and we'd go over to the Memorial Hospital and we would sing for the elderly. And as difficult as it was at times, it was very rewarding knowing that we had brought some joy to these people. We also would carol at Christmas time from door to door in the neighborhood. That was so much fun. Loved hot chocolate afterwards. I also spending time with Wendy Ball at choir practice with Earl Kep. Wonderful experience. Not only through Thank the choir, so but also the amount of time that I would spend over at the manse because of Wendy. <laughs> and I got to know uh, another aspect of the church Wonderful. beyond the building itself. And the one thing that I remember with Reverend Ball, his study in the beautiful rolled up desk he had in that house. Um, and also just the general family atmosphere it extended one step further. St. So Andrews, this week, I think of after our board um, meeting and the ministers the that were there, 
There was Reverend Rose. There was Reverend wherever we are on our anniversary. I started looking through Brown and Reverend Murphy. I wanted to set up that table. This. In 1968, I married Philip Rescolo. The wedding took place at the Angels Church in St. Thomas. Reverend Merkley also officiated a service. A wedding reception was held at the St. Andrew's Church Hall, and it came across the priest and Reverend Merkley attended the reception as well. Wonderful that both of them officiated. It was a wonderful day. So many things that a person could in mention, but this is one that I wanted to pass along. <laughs> Running it past Richie, I'm thinking of certain it, Reggie was I remember the garden. Probably purpose. didn't have as much Just facial hair or on right the here. property and the things and I came across, across this little fish gold one. From the I often wanted to have an anniversary. Um, it says string on the end of the pole on the other side. We get in prize it. Yeah, I don't know where it came from. And the hot dogs, the steaming hot dogs to this day, I've never had a hot dog. says this booklet has been made up. One of the minute books available. It's the history of West Valley Union Mission. Absolutely so, wonderful. And Canada. just the whole, uh, later known the as whole idea of Church. seeing this West Valley Union Mission such a came fun to be on December 22nd, 1913. Yet another day. <laughs> when the following was, people gathered um, at 51 and, uh, Chester Street. Brothers, Is that your sisters, neighborhood, Steve? Kathy. What, are, what number are you? Us? Uh, Your 50th is over right next door. Passed away to Steve. At 36. <laughs> um, Jack, St. Thomas to sign their names to, to, a to a document Alma, to become incorporated. And as our secretary at St. Andrews. A motion was Bill, made to purchase, 30, uh, to purchase lot 35 on the east side uh, of West Ave from do, Robert yeah, Cranston for the sum of, get this, $600. Family, which we did. I grew up at 50. Yeah. With a down payment of three hundred dollars and the balance in on time at five percent interest. I remember so actually our, our going to church down and here at that age and Sunday. Uh, this is Annie Putnam, who was the president of Ladies Aids and requested my mother received a request from the trustees for, for the money that they had on hand. Turned over on February 19, the full amount was paid off on August 22, 1914. Seven trustees plus signing the receipt. Then Mrs. Neckel, who is the my object sister's of forming a trustees board was to erect a building for uh, the purpose of conducting a school, school for educating any and all strict. who may come, we not only as a task for religious learning, games. but for any we other other purpose, fun things as trustees together, may deem fit, and to raise money for the purpose of kids. A five in one house, five in another house. On April 17, 1914. Sanders and Bell's tender was accepted, to this and they requested tonight. to have a you building erected and ready for the occupancy by June 15, 1914. So I remember that's where the, the minister at the time was Reverend Royal. The trustees the authorized Robert Cranston to secure a, a mortgage for it. In the corner of the building, <laughs> this I was there. $2,500 to build this church was built for $2,500. We can't even fix the main our sound system. Or from halfway the from the ground. Doesn't oh, After which he did at stone, 7% uh, interest. Royal, so we shouldn't complain about the interest rate. Uh, with the London Industry the Trust Company, the mortgage was paid off by November 1st, of the they were 1919. But it wasn't until November 4th, 1938, uh, program that the, the burning of the mortgage took place. List of the official board of the church in Calgary from the Church in 1926. The congregation had been accepted to the church. And Marjorie gave me some paperwork. This is a minister's report from the year 1987. Now, Mar I know Marjorie knows this, so no cheating and asking Marjorie. Do you know who your minister was back in 1987? Nope. David Moore, you are right. So, cute story here. There was a cute little baby born while David Moore here was here. Her name was Avila. Avila was a classmate of mine at Emmanuel College. She is now an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. There's a little piece of history for you. So I'm going to read this to you. The year 1987 was a very big year for both St. Andrews and myself. While the reports throughout this book will give you an idea of the increased strength numerically, 
numerically and financially, they cannot reflect the growth in which this congregation spiritually as well. But one need only to come to worship services or other events to see this very real growth. For my, myself, I will look back at 1987 as a year of highlights. Remember way back in January when the UCW celebrated their 25th anniversary? It was a great way to start off the year. Then for myself came the time of final interviews for ordination. It was a time of real stress, yet a time of growth as well. February brought the Scouters Parade to church. Then in March, we celebrated our 73rd anniversary with one of the most moving and memorable services of the year. Then in April, we celebrated Easter with the Easter story enacted for us while the lesson was read. May was, for me, the real highlight of my ministry so far, as I was ordained at Sault Ste. Marie. What made it even better is that so many from St. Andrews were able to come with me on that very special day. It was also the day the news came that I was to be settled here. Things were going very well indeed. From that point on, I must confess, I was looking forward with anticipation to October 3rd. It was on that day that I married my beautiful wife, Wendy. I am pleased to have her by my side throughout my ministry, starting at St. Andrews in St. Thomas. I must not forget the great celebration of the sacraments that occurred there on Pentecost. It was a long service on a hot day, and the church was packed. What a celebration. The summer months brought our vacation Bible school. It proved to be not only a good Bible school, but a great tool for evangelism as well. September brought the resumption of Sunday school, but with a new integrated curriculum called the whole people of God. And just an FYI, the whole people of God, this year was discontinued. One of the really special things about this curriculum is that it provides for all levels of instructions, including adults. October brought an opportunity for the people of St. Andrews to share worship with the president of London Conference, Beth Chapman, and her husband, Reverend David Chapman. For Thanksgiving Sunday, while well, Wendy and I were on our honeymoon. Advent 1987 brought us special services each week focusing on different aspects of preparation for Christmas, and the year ended with small groups sharing fellowship and worship together at the church on New Year's Eve. I would like to thank all of you who showed up so much love and support to myself and Wendy during this very important year in our lives. For the celebration of my ordination and all the beautiful gifts I've received, I thank you. The celebration and gifts of the people of St. Andrews have done so much to make this past year, 1987, the best ever. God bless you all in 1988. In God's service, Reverend David Moore. So here's a little piece of his shares, a little bit of history for you. I had a DVD of the 100th anniversary special that I'm going to play out there when we are closer to uh, our time together. So let's sing Faith of Our Fathers, number 580 in Voices United.
I may have only been ordained eight years ago, but I can tell you I was a lot older than David Moore was when he got ordained. Luke 9. Verses 51 to 62. The Samaritan Opposition. As the time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead. They sent into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, rebuked them, and they went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds have the air, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever tried walking backwards? For me, what happens? What happens for you, Don? I heard you say yes back there. What happens if you walk backwards? Nothing? Oh, you got eyes in the back of your head? Oh, good, good. That gets good. I know what happens when I try walking back. What happens, Lexi? Yeah, you might run into something or someone, right? I try walking backwards, and I'm sure I'm going to trip or sprain an ankle or break something or someone. I am not Michael Jackson. I cannot moonwalk. So why? Why am I this way? Despite the fact that I have convinced my kids that I have eyes in the back of my head, they swore when they were growing up that I did because I knew what they were doing in the, in the back of the minivan that we used to drive. That's all mothers. That's right. That's what I told them. When you become a mother, you get eyes in the back of your head. They hadn't clued into the fact that I do have a rear view mirror that can see what they're doing, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I would say that unless that I can't actually see behind me very well. I have pretty good peripheral vision, but not behind me. And I would say that's probably true for most people, unless you're part owl. But the best course of action 
is to look in the direction you're going, that you're moving. So if you're moving forward, you need to be looking for it. If you're moving backwards, I suggest you turn around. There are times when you leave the comforts of your home and let go of the tour posts and move into uncharted waters. That's what Jesus was trying to say in this scripture passage that I just read. Jesus knew that his disciples would soon be doing exactly that after he was gone. They would be needing to move in a new direction. They would need to be moving into uncharted water without him. And then it goes on a little further and talks about some other things. And then it says, and I love this reference because it's a really good farm reference. Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, this is when I would normally walk about and use my hands more, but I'm going to be stay here. So who here has ever tried to plow, <clears throat> drive a tractor and plow? Connie had, oh, and Glenn, you have, oh, good, 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 no. So you know that when you plow a field, you don't just start at one edge of the field and work your way across. If cultivating, yes, but not when you're plowing. When you plow a field the first time, it's a little different. Go partway across the field, and then you strike out the field. So what does that mean? What does it mean to strike out the field? It's not baseball. There's nothing, no, no balls are being pitched and misses. What you do is you look down at the end of the row and you kind of make an imaginary line and you aim for that point across the end of the field. And that's where you're driving towards that point that uh, or marker that you're focused on as you drive forward. If you look back, what happens when you look back and you've got your hand on the steering wheel and you look back? Your hand moves, your row will be crooked. It's not a good idea. It's actually quite an art to strike out a field and keep it straight. Your furrow will not be straight if you are looking back behind you. And it messes up the whole field, not just that particular furrow. It messes up the entire field. You will not have a straight row in the field. It doesn't take much to go off of the field. It's not an easy task. In fact, so much so it's become an art, and that's why we have these things called plowing matches. Yeah, so you've probably been to and the international plowing match, or maybe, I know Elgin County has a plowing match every year, and it moves around to different places. But if you've ever been to the plowing match, you can actually watch them compete for who's got the straightest rows in the plowing match. It's quite, a, it's quite a competition. You have to go beyond all those booths and tents and check out the plowing sometimes. It's quite impressive, especially if they're plowing with horses and ox and or ox. That adds a whole other complication to the process because then you're trying to lead from behind and you are leading a stubborn critter. So that has a mind of its own and will go where it wants to. But I believe that Jesus' point was that things were changing. Times were changing. He would no longer be there with them. And they wouldn't be able to rely on him to keep them straight, to keep them going towards the mark. They would be striking out on their own, chartering a new path, a new furrow. He was insisting that they try something new. He didn't want them to get stalled waiting around for him and, and telling them what to do because he wasn't going to be there. Instead, he insisted that they find their mark, aim for it, and just go. Don't let anything distract you from that mark or goal. I'm going to embarrass my son. My son will tell you what happens when you get distracted and you're driving the tractor. He was on his cell phone one day as the young people do these days. And um, he didn't realize he'd gotten to the end of the field and he ended up, <clears throat> well, let's put it this way, he had to call his dad for a distress call at the end of the field because he was in a ditch. That's what happens when you get distracted, right? How often do we get caught looking behind us though too or get distracted? Goodness knows. In the course of any conversation with me, 
you will notice how easily distracted I am. And there's also a reason I keep notes in front of me because I am easily distracted. Just ask Susan how easily we say, she has to say, she's like, mm hmm yeah, can't carry a conversation with Cheryl without her going squirrel somewhere off in the world. Just, distracted, and of course, distracted driving is one of the leading causes of accidents. Why? Well, because we aren't paying attention to where we are going. So as a church, where are we going? Well, let's rewind to the beginning of this scripture passage. And it says, at that time approached for him to be taken up into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of, ahead of him who went into Samaritan village to get things ready. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading from, for Jerusalem. When the disciples saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and then he and his disciples went to a different village. The plan is to visit the Samaritan village. Didn't work out. For whatever reason, they weren't ready to hear God's message, and they weren't ready to receive him. But instead of destroying the village, like the disciples had suggested, Jesus rebuked the disciples for suggesting it. That would be a distraction from their goal. Gosh, I'm thinking, you know, if you're on a mission to love your neighbors as yourself, and then when you're traveling through a neighborhood, just because you think they, they think differently than you, you want to destroy them, then you're maybe getting off course, way off course, and other towns will be watching. If you go around destroying villages and other people instead of spreading love, think about it. How welcome are you really going to be in other communities? Oh, sure, they may well to say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're welcome here. That's because they're afraid of you, not because they want you there. How welcome will you be? Maybe out of fear, but that's not the goal. Everything we do, you do, I do, the church does, is visible to someone. And when you think about it, you hear in the media how many people are putting down the church because of something the church has done. You know they're watching. They're watching us. So we need to be really careful about the message we are sending. Someone is always watching. When you plow a field, or plant a field for that matter, and your row is crooked, it's very visible. This is my favorite time of year because I can do something that I love to do. As a farm wife, it means money in the bank. I look across the field just as the plants are coming through the ground, and you can start to see the rows. You can start to see if you plant that row crooked as well. It's called rowing a field, and I love to do it. Um, if you go to a field that was planted about two weeks ago, you can start to just start to see those little plants popping up through the ground. Go for a drive this week and try it. Just look across the field, and you'll see the little rows, whether it's beans or corn or whatever they've planted. Doesn't usually work for wheat fields or fields of grass and whatnot because they are broadcast spread sometimes. So, But corn and beans for sure. Go for a drive and check it out and see if you can identify the rows of corn or beans. It's very satisfying as a farmer. Not just because of the sense of pride you get that your rear rows are straight, but it's the knowledge that there will be a harvest or a better chance of there being a harvest. And while the mark was at the far end of the field, that you were aiming for, it's actually what happens between where you started and that mark that really matters. That's where the fruit of your labor is. It's that point in between. It's what we do on our journey of life. It's what we do on our journey as the church that will determine what our harvest is, how we are living, 
You know, they often say, have you probably heard the poem of called The Dash and how you live between your birth and death? That dash is what happens in between. That's what the harvest is. What you harvest between the point where you started in the field and that point at the other end, what's in between is where your labor lies. So as a church, what is our mark? What is the goal at the end of the row? It's to love and serve God, to love one another, to love our neighbor. But if we get distracted from that goal, that mark, if we spread hate because someone else distracts us with lies and tells us that we're looking at the wrong mark by telling us who we can and cannot love and show compassion for someone just because they worship differently, speak differently, love differently, dress differently, think differently. If we let someone else tell us who we can love, then we're getting off course because our goal as followers of Jesus is to do what Jesus instructed that rich young man to do in the Bible. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. The board made a decision this week that I am very proud of because it really helped us to refocus our attention on loving our neighbors. We have opted to join the Pride in the Park on August 13th um, for a worship, an interfaith worship service to supporting their Pride community. At a time when there was there is so much rise up again in hatred against our community, it may not be a popular stance with some fractions of the community, but I believe it's the right thing to do. We don't hate people just because they don't agree with us. They're entitled to their opinion, and they can take it up with God when they meet him. But we don't hate others because they think and love differently than we do. That's not right either. A lot of people think we, the church, have been going downhill for decades. And in some ways, they may be right. But in other ways, in focusing on the goal, those two goals, loving God and loving others, I think we have made great strides in the church. We're learning to love unconditionally. God loves everyone. We're learning to love, and I thank God for that. Let us carry that love into the world and spread love, not hate. Amen. Let us sing number 595, We Are Pilgrims on a Journey.
When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Of all we found together, of Christ alone. We are the church together, each of us an important part, sharing in the responsibility to reach out to those in need, to keep the building in good condition and to pay the running costs. As we consider what to give this morning on our church's anniversary, we reflect on what this church and this congregation has meant to us over the years, to our families and generations gone before us and generations growing up in our midst. You each are the blessing who brings the life, love, and possibilities to this church. Our gifts this morning reflect our love and commitment. Let us praise God from whom all blessings flow. God of joy, thank you for all that we have. Receive these gifts given with joy and thanksgiving. May they support the work of the faithful to bring justice and joy to all people. Amen. Okay, what are we celebrating today? Well, you know, one thing for sure we're celebrating. Well, two things we're celebrating. We're celebrating the anniversary of the church and of the United Church of Canada. But we are also celebrating a much younger Joyce. <laughs> uh, so happy birthday to Joyce and to anybody else who may be celebrating this week or in the coming weeks. But happy birthday to you as, as well. What else are we celebrating today? <clears throat> Family movies? Ah. Very good. Hey. Oh, wow. Really old ones. Wow, that's really something. Wow. Absolutely. And enjoy. Well, that's really cool. The video that I have of the church isn't isn't quite that bad. <laughs> isn't quite that old. <laughs> this is from. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there would be no sound. No. Yeah. Yes. So that that would be kind of cool too. That would be neat. That's really cool. That's really cool. Oh, I'm sure. A lot of laughter. <laughs> well, you don't watch in the hockey game. The Leafs aren't in it anymore. It doesn't really matter now. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm glad you're having some fun with the old videos. And yeah, that's, that's wonderful. To, wonderful to hear. What else are we thankful for? Yeah, we have some great numbers here today. And all, I could hear all the... Mutter, not muttering, but or all the, 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 the noise going on this morning before the service. It was really kind of nice to hear all the, the loud 
not the loud, but you know what I mean, like the volume of the number of people. It was wonderful to hear. And it's lovely to see all your faces as well. And we think of all those whose faces we would like to be here, but can't be here as well. What else are we thinking? Anything else we're thankful for? Yes, Belinda. Isn't that the truth? I'll put that air quality and I'll tell you, I was concerned that I wasn't going to be able to. Our beans did come up, have come up now too, but I, we, we really need that water. The gardens and the crop fields all need a drink, a good drink of water. Yes. Yeah, we've got people from all over the world. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, Belinda, I saw your hand up down there. Yes. Oh, good. But she's good. But it's working. Thank you for the modern medicine, too, and the doctors and nurses. That's wonderful. What are we concerned about? My daughter's been in the Yes. Oh dear. So hopefully they do something. Yeah, we'll keep her. And yeah, yeah, it's always concerning when our kids are sick, no matter how old they are. Yeah. yeah. What else are we concerned about? Anything else? Oh, goodness. No, they do not, but a, a, a Bendix can be a very serious thing, but if they've sent her home, then that's a good sign. That's a good sign that she's made a good recovery. Oh, goodness. She's probably on antibiotics as well, then, if it bursts, because she'll be worried about sepsis. Yeah, you always sleep better in your own bed, don't you? Wonderful. Okay. Let's take all these concerns and these... Blessings and bring them before God. On this anniversary day, we thank you, Lord, for this community of faith. We praise you for all the joy that we have known in this fellowship, and we pray for all those who together make up this community of your faith, of your people, so that our church may be a real home for all who share its life. We pray for those who bear responsibility of leadership, that they may be guided by your wisdom and sustained by your strength. We pray for our young people, for the growing youth program, the ch children and teens of this community, the young adults. We pray that they may grow in faith and renew the vision of the church. We pray for those who work to enhance our worship through singing and music, for Thomas and Belinda and all of our other church musicians, for Myrna and all of those, and Lynn, who all help us out uh, to sing and raise our voices those who have read scripture and passages for us, those who help us with decorating this sanctuary, through worship leadership, the mailbox ministry, those who put miles on their car to make sure that those who can't make it to service still can worship with us and know that they are thought about. We thank you for our live stream texts back there, that they may be be channels of your love and your grace and find joy in your service. We pray for those who meet for the prayer shawl ministry, for meditations, for those through devotion, the whole fellowship may be enriched. We pray for the groups that meet for friendship and recreation, for our Euchre group, our UCW, our outreach groups like the youth choir and our Alzheimer's group that in them we may find true fellowship and discover Christ in their neighbor. We pray for all who maintain the fabric of our church, the building committee and the custodian, the paid and the volunteer, and for all who hold office in the church. May they, ever be, may they be ever aware that they are workers in your kingdom, and may they know that they are loved and appreciated for all they do. We pray for all who use our premises, that they may find us welcoming and hospitable. 
Lord, we give thanks for their work and witness, and we pray for your blessing upon them. Lord God, you have called us to share the joy and fullness of life that you give in your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our church may be a blessing to all in this neighborhood so that more and more people may come to love and trust you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, usually at this point in the service, we would say the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to get you because it's our anniversary and the anniversary of the United Church of Canada. We're going to stand and say the Creed, which is at the back of your Bible, of your hymn books, but I also have it up there. <laughs> if you're able and you want to stand to do this, you may do that as well. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. I was going to suggest we sing our last hymn as a round, but it's really difficult, and, and I don't want to throw Thomas off too badly. So we're just going to sing it three times through. It's just one verse. We'll sing it three times through. Don't forget to clap. I'll stand away from the mic when I clap, so I don't deafen you. Rejoice in the Lord always, two or 249. And if you can, if you want to stand, go for it. Okay, we're going to go a little faster this time. Are you ready? All right. Rejoice in the Lord always. One last time, let's see if we can outrun Thomas. All right? Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Rejoice in the Lord. All right, it was a tie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me, guys. <laughs> oh. Go into the world strengthened by the past, inspired by the opportunities before us, and surrounded by the love of this amazing family of God. Go out with joy to be God's people today and always. Amen.